Okay, then it's my pleasure to uh, give the word to the last speaker, Kurt Rice. Thank you. I had the pleasure of starting this year, 2012, by um, being informed by the Ministry of Education and Research in Norway that my university had won uh, the National Gender Equality Prize this year. And that's a prize that goes to an organization in research or higher education somewhere in Norway as a way of recognizing the work that's been done at that institution in this area. For a person uh, who's in a leadership position, the prize actually creates an opportunity because it carries a significant cash award. We receive this prize for gender equality and gender balance work uh, on our faculty. We, over the course of 10 years, went from being the University of Norway with the fewest uh, women professors to being the university with the most. And we also received the prize on the basis of a project that we've been running that we call the Promotion Project. And what I would like to do is tell you both a little bit about some of the innovations associated with that Promotion Project and tell you a little bit about a new project that we're starting with that prize money about gendered innovations, gender perspectives in research and education. These projects are uh, related in a number of ways. They share a rhetoric, for example. They're built on a rhetoric that insists that the work of equality enhancement is the work of quality enhancement. And they're built on a rhetoric that insists that making universities into better workplaces for women will make them into better workplaces for everyone. I want to um, give a few examples of the cultural changes that have happened at my university beyond the specific uh, project participants to, to illustrate this. And I would like to say that my thoughts about um, gender balance and gender equality have been uh, heavily influenced by the opportunity that I had to participate in the GenSet project. And if you're not familiar with the GenSet project, I'd like to strongly encourage you to visit genderinscience.org. It's full of wonderful uh, resources, hundreds of references, probably thousands of references, and a set of recommendations about how institutions can uh, move forward both in terms of gender equality and gender balance and in terms of gendered perspectives in science. I will allow myself to mention that the University of Tromsø, where I work, was the first university in Europe to formally adopt the GenSet recommendations and the projects that we're running are part of the work that we're doing to implement those. So let me tell you um, just a little bit about the promotion project. The context for this project is that in Norway, to get to the top level of the academic career path, the individual has to initiate the promotion process. So as an associate professor, I myself have to apply to be considered for a full professor. My department chair doesn't take that initiative. My dean doesn't take that initiative. It's the individual himself or herself who takes that initiative. That system already invites the opportunity for um, seeing sex differences between, between the ways that men and women respond to that kind of requirement. And I would say that in academic careers in general, the importance of self-promotion in various contexts is an example of a structure of these careers that plays itself out differently for men and women. The first thing that we did then in this promotion project, <clears throat> after having uh, identified a group of participants, and I, I won't be able to go through um, the entire project here, but it's described uh, in great detail on a, a blog that I run. So if you look for a Kurt Rice blog, you'll find a detailed description of the promotion project. But the first um, innovation that we did in this project is that we simulated the promotion experience. So we took a group of about 50 women who were associate professors and their chairs and deans, 
And we uh, trained them specifically to prepare for the promotion process. And we actually simulated that quite realistically. So the participants um, worked out uh, the carefully detailed letters of promotion that are required. They put together the portfolio. We engaged external experts and asked them to write a report of exactly the same type we would write uh, in a real promotion situation. And we also asked them to specifically uh, state for the individual what she needed to do to be able to uh, get to the point where she could apply for promotion. And we then uh, instructed department chairs to work out a two-year plan with those individuals for how they would achieve um, what they needed to achieve in order to be able to actually apply for, um, for promotion. And we had set off uh, significant resources so that women who needed um, who needed, for example, a research assistant, who needed a statistician, who needed an external evaluator of a book manuscript, had the opportunity to apply for funds to be able to carry those things out. And the last um, feature of the project that I wanted to briefly mention is that we introduced something that we call write-ins, where we uh, took this group of women away for a week and instructed their chairs and uh, deans to leave them alone, and we had no program. We had a few writing coaches around. All of the practical details were taken care of. And their job was to spend that week uh, taking one of the uh, pieces of feedback they had received on their trial evaluation and then trying to, to work on it. And we've done that over the last year and a half. We've done that three times with this group. So those are uh, a few of the core features of that project. Now, this project has really um, become the work of cultural change at my university. And I would like to mention just briefly a few of the ways in which um, I think that's true. First of all, um, it's been an opportunity to change the rhetoric that we use. And I mentioned this earlier, but it's really become pervasive now at my university that we uh, our university culture is one which accepts the claim that the work of equality is the work of quality enhancement. The project has also been important because it's contributed to the professionalization of leadership. So we have a tradition, uh, at least in Norway, of a relatively hands-off approach to being a departmental chair or departmental dean. And indeed, uh, previously, gender equality work has often been um, pursued um, in Norway anyway through rather traditional mentoring projects. And I specifically decided not to use uh, so-called mentors but rather to use departmental chairs to work with uh, the, the, the applicants and the candidates exactly in order to um, anchor this process in the normal uh, line of management. What department chairs tell me is that the training they received in the context of the promotion project has enabled them to carry out a much more engaged career development work with everybody in their department. And it's enhanced the workplace then, especially for younger faculty members, and both men and women. Indeed, this project, uh, as yet another point of cultural change, has legitimized the whole notion of career planning, which I would suggest that academics um, frequently aren't encouraged to think carefully about. It's also been important to clarify the promotion procedure. It's a, a mystery to many academics what they really need to do to get to the next level. And I think that uh, we see examples of that both in Europe and North America, where my experience in North America is that um, people on the tenure track often are very unsure about what exactly they have to do in order to get tenure, even having asked. The project also has um, changed the legitimacy of strategic work at the university. Part of the reason we started this project is because our board of directors said that by 2013, we want 30% of our top academic positions to be filled by women. It was a very specific goal set by the board, and it was my job to make that happen. And because we've been able to do this in a way that has been interesting and exciting for everyone on campus, it gives, uh, as I said, increased legitimacy to, the, to any kind of strategic um, task. 
And finally, I would uh, say that it's been a culture-changing experience because we know that our reputation has been significantly enhanced through the visibility of this work, and that contributes in a number of ways, not least of all, to recruiting. So I just recently, um, a week ago, got the, the most current numbers, and at, our, at the top of the academic career at the University of Tromsø in 2001, 9% of the people there were women, and this year 35% are women. So we've made, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we've, we've flown past our goal of getting to 30% by 2013, and um, it, you know, change is possible. With focused, committed, uh, deliberate work, change is possible. And in light of that, uh, inspired by that, encouraged by that, I wanted to try a change in a different area, in the area of gendered science. So, um, as I said, we took the prize money, uh, which is several hundred thousand euros, and we um, started a new project very recently to work uh, within the university to increase awareness and engagement about gendered perspectives in science and in teaching. And we've heard some wonderful examples of that kind of work this morning, so I don't need to be too concrete. I would like to say, however, that from my perspective uh, in a vice rector's position, I want to um, be clear with you about what my goals are. And of course, one of my goals is that I uh, understand that introducing these perspectives into our research and our curricula are quality enhancing moves. But I also have other goals. For example, the Research Council of Norway says that gendered perspectives will be a point of evaluation in all applications to all programs. Horizon 2020, I hope, will be approved with a requirement for including gendered perspectives in uh, research programs. Because of those kinds of requirements, I know that my university will experience a competitive advantage in those competitions if I'm able to train my faculty members to introduce gendered perspectives into their research projects. I want I want to succeed in those contexts. I want that competitive advantage, and this is one strategy for getting it. So I'm engaged in working on that. I'm interested in working on that. So how have we started? We started um, through our, uh, because of our awareness, actually through the Genset, of the Gendered Innovations um, Project that several people here are involved in, and that's led by Londa Schiebinger. And Londa was just recently in Tromsø, only a few weeks ago, uh, to carry out a kickoff seminar on gendered perspectives in research. I announced that seminar and I announced at the same time that uh, funds would be available to research groups to develop their projects in this direction, but only to groups that participated in that seminar. And there was a tremendous turnout. <laughs> And it was a, it was a, it was a, an, a very exciting day. I had the experience during that day of seeing a discovery in front of my very eyes, of seeing talented, skilled researchers who just hadn't thought about these things understand new, uh, new things about their own projects. A fellow from the medical school could come in and tell that he had just received results from a bone marrow transplant project that he had done, that he had done with mice, where he had, um, had done bone marrow transplants with, with many, many mice, and he had lost all of the male mice. And he was mystified by that. On the Gendered Innovations website that several people have told you about, there's actually a case study there about stem cell work. And he had had a look at that before the seminar. And he realized that the donor mice he had used were all female mice. And he started to wonder if that was an effector. I had an email from him this morning telling me that he had gone back and looked at his earlier protocols and seen um, all sorts of patterns and new situations where he realized that he had to study much more carefully the sex differences between donor and recipients in bone marrow transplants. So that was a discovery that he had at this seminar. Now, what I've done with these funds that we received is that I've advertised 
And what Norwegians call Professor Two positions, they're kind of consulting professorships, let's say, where a person from another institution has a small engagement. And I've advertised those internally then on campus, where the idea is that uh, existing research groups can apply to get one of those positions to bring somebody in who will be able to add a gendered perspective to the research uh, that they're already uh, um, engaged in. We have a strong history of using these consulting professorship positions in Tromsø for gender equality work. Uh, we regularly advertise a pool of such positions that are earmarked for women. So, so groups can apply for them, but they must hire a woman into those positions. Now we are uh, moving in the direction of using them, well, we've started using them now, um, um, to add to gendered perspectives in uh, research groups. The project's just starting. I don't have results to tell you. I can tell you that there's significant interest and engagement, and, and the groups see this as an opportunity uh, for equality enhancement of their research. It's crucial, of course, to do this training. It's crucial to give economic support. And I'd like to wrap up with a question and um, hope that maybe somebody can enlighten me. Because I'm talking about two different domains of gendered work. One is, uh, let's say, the human resources domain where we care about getting more, we care about gender balance, we care about having good representation of both men and women all the way throughout the, along the career path. And the other one is that we're talking about gendered perspectives in research. And what I don't know is if there's a connection. That connection could be, for example, if research groups that have gender balance are more likely to include gendered perspectives in their research questions. I've tried to find research about this. I've talked to Londa Schiebinger and others about this. I don't know of any, and I would love to know about it. So uh, let me just conclude by saying that a focus on quality, a focus on gendered perspectives, and, um, and careers and the quality enhancement that that offers can lead to cultural change. And I think that's a crucial part of making these issues issues for everyone and not just issues for women. The core um, challenge, as I see it, and the, the cultural development we want, we want to make is to move away from the idea that we're engaged in the work of gender equality, gender balance, and gender science because it's the right thing to do, and instead replace that with the view that the work of gender equality, gender balance, and gender perspectives is the smart thing to do. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. Any clues from the floor? To the very back, please. Hello, sorry. Uh, I don't have any clues, but I do have a, a question, if that's okay, sorry. Um, I'm Gemma Irvine from the Irish Research Council, um, and we're currently looking at all of our terms and conditions um, because we've recently merged into one council. We used to be humanities and social sciences, and then um, the, the sciences, and so it's a great opportunity for us, I think, to have a look at these issues and, and basically uh, forge a new path. Um, so my question is, in, in regards to the funds that were put up for the researchers to incorporate a, a gender perspective into their research um, and their attendance at the seminar, which I think is a fantastic idea, um, what were they going to use that funds for? Was that to get the gender expert to advise on their project? Um, and how, how much funds were you giving up for them to, to do this? Right. So um, the goal was that existing research groups would enhance their project by adding a gendered perspective and that these funds would make it possible. So what I did is I advertised, so to speak, internally, advertised internally at the university as several uh, two-year con consulting professorships is what they're called. Um, so the research groups, I'm actually doing that right now, so, the, so I haven't awarded them yet. I'll do that in the next few months. But the research groups then are able to apply to get funding for a two-year consulting professor to uh, work with their group to uh, develop the existing research focus of that group so that it 
uh, to a greater extent will include gendered perspectives. I also have advertised uh, some less specified funds uh, for, for teaching programs who want to work to uh, increase gendered perspectives in the curriculum of their, of their teaching programs. At this point, altogether, it's um, 2 million Norwegian kroner, which is like 350,000 euros. Ines? Thank, thank you. I, I would like to um, add a comment to your last um, issue on, on how um, research content and presence of women in teams interrelate. I think this is a, a crucial aspect that we need to explore further. There is some uh, research that shows, for instance, this has been done by Professor Cecilia Castaño in Spain from the WOC. Uh, she has worked in the TIC, in the, uh, in the communications uh, information technology sector, and she has uh, made research on how, what's the impact of having mixed teams of men and women, and she has found out that the impact in terms of uh, the standard scientific quality measures of publications uh, impact, as was explained a, a while ago, uh, it was better, it was improved in teams where there were more women. Well, that were more diverse. It's not exactly the, the, the relationship with the inclusion of the gender topics, uh, but it's an indicator of how diversity, gender diversity brings a difference to, to, to performance. And then I, I just very briefly would like to make a comment that I wasn't able to, to do in the previous, uh, in response to our colleague from Nigeria. She mentioned the issue of, uh, of women's rights. And uh, while we like to stress uh, the importance of quality and efficiency of having more women, this is a very powerful argument, and it is very uh, politically a useful argument, but we, I think that we must not forget, particularly in Europe where the Treaty of Amsterdam and all our European regulations stress that equality and human rights are the base of our Constitution, constitution is the base of, of, of it's the, the, the legal base on which we build all our policy, including science policy. So we cannot forget the argument that our colleague from Nigeria has reminded us. And as far as hostility in the workplace, in the, in the structural change report that the European Commission published last year, which is going to be the it, it, it was commissioned by the commission, sorry, uh, as a base. Uh, uh, Thomas was a member of, of the expert group that produced it. Um, it, it, it. It was commissioned as a base for the recommendation that Dr. Pauli mentioned this morning that the commission is going to issue next year. And within this report, we address this topic and one, among many others. And we mention as an example of best practice around the world on dealing with the issue of harassment, not only sexual, but also harassment based on gender-based harassment, which is a slightly different concept. Um, the, the, the example of the University of Stanford, where everybody has to take compulsorily a training course where uh, what harassment behaviors are, mm -hmm. uh, how they mm -hmm. find, and how to mm -hmm. proceed in case. And, and it's compulsory, everybody has to take it, online every year. Uh, so there are many, many more examples. I'm just pointing out to this one. Thank you. Okay, I guess we are moving into the final discussion. So we have... So first of all, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers on the podium for their self-discipline contributions. As far as time is concerned, so we have number one, Elizabeth number two, and you are number three. And then maybe Kurt and you may take over for the final discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Geraldine Healy, Queen Mary University of London, um, where we have a centre for research in equality and diversity. Thank you for your presentation. I, I found it quite inspiring, a number of the things that you were doing. Um, we, we have done research on Scandinavian academics who underperform um, in terms of their career development and achievement to chairs compared to their world standing on gender. And one of the things that was very clear is that academics, um, women academics, often find they're excluded from key networks. Uh, decisions are made on the basis of their potential or actual reproductive capacity. 
um, and, and so on. In other words, there's an exclusionary context. So I was very interested in what you were doing, and I wondered how you were seeking to overcome what must be key institutional barriers. And I think the emphasis on institutions earlier this morning was really, really important. Um, and the resistance to change, because a lot of the gender um, negative cultures actually are very informal, they're very hard to grasp. Um, so th th that would be my question, I and I'd also like to support our colleagues who've questioned the issue of putting right to one side. Uh, right must remain central in gender equality aspects. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Can I answer that? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, when I say that uh, we should have a focus on this kind of work as a smart thing to do, um, what I, I in no way mean to undermine the extent to which it's the right thing to do. I simply wonder if maybe we've gotten as far as we can with those more traditional arguments. And I want to supplement them with new arguments. Um, regarding the first part of your comment, another aspect of the work we're engaged in to get more women to the top is that we, just to illustrate one example of a structural barrier and how I'm dealing with it, we, of course, occasionally advertise full professorships. Those often, I have had noticed, get extremely few applicants, and I believe that the reason for that is because the descriptions are far too narrow. They're really aimed at uh, an individual or at uh, scientific reproduction. And so what we have done at the University of Tromsø is that we have adopted a requirement, uh, first of all, to use um, search committees, not after a position is announced, but before a position is announced, to, to uh, survey the landscape for potential applicants, and we've added a requirement that although we can't earmark positions for women, that the applicant pool must be gender balanced before they are allowed to proceed to a hiring. So they have to uh, pursue um, yeah, gender balance in the applicant pool. And that is intended to work against a structural challenge, namely the power to, um, um, how do you say that, how to tailor uh, job announcements for specific individuals or a very, very small group of individuals. Okay, the word that hasn't been mentioned is excellence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what it all resolves ar around because even if you put more women in the, in, the, in the lab, but they are trained on the same bias, the methodologies and the same uh, bias accepted in the science knowledge base, there's no way that they're going to suddenly come up with their uh, different ideas. They are going to have a different perspective, but the basis of their knowledge is biased, yes? Mm -hmm. So for your male example, I have an example of a female, right. yes? So with my, uh, also, yes, so I think we should not put the expectation that women suddenly have a new insights into excellence. Excellence, we have to question the excellence Um, Ludwika Lichte, University of Twente, the Netherlands. Thanks a lot for the uh, talks and especially the last one. I, I am puzzled about this uh, connection of the group membership uh, in science and the gender perspectives in research. Um, I've been doing research on problem choice, so how different disciplinary groups decide on what kind of problems will be pursued in science, and not hard science but also soft science. And what I've seen that there is very, very strong difference. First of all, there are hierarchies. So it's the project leader who decides on the problem choice mostly. Juniors usually f are following. It can differ from the field because in the humanities it can be less so because it's more individual oriented science. So hierarchies are important. However, what's influencing the direction of research is also external funding agencies these days. And they tend to influence juniors more than the seniors. Seniors mm -hmm. can go on with the mainstream. So they have already part dependency. So this is just to shed a bit more light on what's going on there. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just usurpating the role of the of leading the final discussion. You raise your arm, please. 
Okay, Silvia Ciotti from Italy, from the Eurocrime Independent Research Center. Uh, just two very, very brief remarks. The first one, uh, I don't know the in-depth, the situation in other countries, but in Italy, for instance, the problem is not having women performing research, working in the universities, and so on. Also, if you look at the approved projects, you can see a lot of women there, but you can just see that all the person in charge, all the person in charge are men. So uh, if you look at these projects, for instance, you can see that the big part of the work is made by women that are coordinating, working, and so on, but the person in charge having the name on publication, projects, and so on, is always a man. So I really appreciated all uh, the description that I heard in these two days regarding the troubles and the numbers, statistics, and so on, and I really understand that this description of the problem, because a problem is it, um, is interesting. The point is that saying numbers, for Italy at least, is not enough, unfortunately. And the other thing regarding, for instance, technology with a gender approach and so on and so on, uh, I'm a bit afraid of that because uh, uh, on the market we yet have things that are sell just for women. In Italy we have cars for women, we have uh, mobile phones, smartphones that are very pink, very pretty, very beautiful because they say, okay, they, these are for women, but they are absolutely the same thing. So we have to be very careful because I think that there is a lot of people just waiting to instrumentalize this kind of uh, Female, not gender approach. Thank you. Okay, two more. Con okay, so maybe Elizabeth, a final remark. Well, thank you very much for your contributions. I'm sorry that we have to stop here, uh, but uh, let's hope that uh, some of the uh, comments will be further discussed uh, during lunch, which will be served outside in a few minutes already. Then, please. You have to find the yes. remark. Thank you. I have the honor to, to close these wonderful one and a half days, and um, I would like to say some things and then ask for your opinion. Um, I couldn't help myself when I was thinking about the sort of general picture that emerged these last one and a half days. I kept thinking of a Chinese proverb. I don't know if you know it. It's, it says, women hold up half the sky. And Half the Sky is also the title of a wonderful book, and if you haven't read it yet, you really should, by two American journalists, uh, Wu Dunn and Christoph, who describe the trials and tribulations of a number of women in absolutely terrible situations and their strengths to get out of them. And if you read that, you really realize how, how this world does discriminate women and how incredibly pervasive this problem is. And they call the, back, the backward position of women globally the number one issue of the modern times. And I totally believe that that's true. So it's no wonder that when we look at science in, in the Western world, in Europe and America, we see the same patterns. Um, and I think that's one of the things we, we can all decide after this gender summit and the last one, that there are two major issues. One is that women uh, get discriminated against. There's a very pervasive bias in science that makes it very hard for them to reach leadership positions. And it starts really early. And one issue that actually wasn't present in this gender summit, but certainly was present last year, uh, was the issue of peer review in journals that the editors often don't send out, especially of very popular journals, very high impact journals, don't even send out certain manuscripts to reviewers. So there, there may be potentially huge biases in the, the desk research and the desk assessment that editors do in journals like The Lancet and PLOS One. And all the editors actually were basically acknowledging that this may be an issue we're never, never looking into. So if you look at the science careers of women, there's bias in their promotion, which is incredibly well documented. There's bias potentially in the chances that they get their articles published. There's bias, and there's no doubt about that, in the chances that they get funded. I mean, it was very obvious from Teresa Lago's presentation yesterday that the ERC panels are biased too. I can't find any other explanation for the persistent difference 
in every domain um, of the grant, grant proposal submission of the difference between the women and the men. 2% lower everywhere. And I can't believe that that's because the quality of their proposals is lower. So women substantially have to face at every step of their career this subtle bias that we call it. And of course it's not so subtle. It may be subtle at, one, at every step, but if you add them all up, these biases, it's one huge, gigantic, very unsubtle bias in the end. Many molehills become one big mountain. And then, of course, there's the second issue of the content of our research and our science that is not gender neutral. We produce a lot of science that is just geared towards one half of the population and that serves men much better than women. And I think that is a much bigger issue if you look at societies than the bias against women scientists. Because what does that mean? that we don't live in the world that we potentially should be living in, if you look at the perspective of women. And it means everything from um, how do we use our technologies, whether medicines are really also good for women or just for men. If we keep using the male model in every study we do, we actually kill women. There have been hundreds or maybe even thousands of female lives lost because we simply don't think about them as a target group for our interventions. It's the same in policies and in political situations. We're very aware nowadays that women are so important in peacekeeping efforts and they're just not being used, all their energies and strengths are not being seen. So on a global level, we're so incredibly underserving half of our society, half of the women that do keep up their part of the sky. So I think, I think we all realize that this is an issue that needs to be addressed urgently. And I think we also all realize that we need the policies. We need funding agencies, we need our parliaments, and we also need the EU Parliament and Commission to step in and do things. And we've had wonderful examples from Austria, from Norway, from other countries of how important it is that the funding agencies and the policy-making bodies say, okay, now we're going to put this on the agenda. Because as soon as there's formal policy, and especially, and that's the only way you can have a good formal policy if that's followed by funding, then things will start moving and people will see opportunities and that needs to happen. So what I want to round up with, with your permission, I hope that's okay, um, is to tell you which three messages I think we can give um, the EU Commission and the EU Parliament and I'm going to ask for a raise of hands if you agree with me and then there are probably a few more minutes for other ideas that I may have missed and I really would love for you to jump in. And we've heard some very concrete examples that we can use, and I was hoping there was going to be something on the screen. This Article 15 of Horizon, the Horizon 2020 framework. Oh, great. This is the only thing it says. It's important the article is in there, but it's very, very short. It just says it shall ensure the effective promotion of gender equality and the gender dimension research and innovation content. And I think for most of the people who need to carry this out, they're completely clueless as to how to do this because you need to understand a lot more than you do just on the basis of this statement. So I have, I have three proposals that we could actually give uh, the people who are now involved in shaping Horizon 2020. I think one very concrete one is the one that Hans Borg, I think, has been talking about for the past one and a half days. I think we really need to push to have women in grade A researcher positions part of the scoreboard 2013. We all agree it's nowhere near enough, but there is a limited number of outcome indicators that are going to be in this scoreboard. So at least let's have this one. So could I see a show of hands? Who, which people in the audience feel that that's one very concre concrete recommendation we could make? <laughs> I, th I think it's a majority, I, it's not all of you, but I think it's a majority enough that we can say that this has been carried by this audience. And another one that I think we really should push for is to make sure that the, um, the ERC, fund, the funds that are being distributed through the ERC, that there is no gender bias in their procedures. And one very concrete thing that we could recommend is that there is training of these panels that look at proposals. These are practices that are tested and tried and very evidence-based. There's huge experience in the US, in Canada, and we can very easily tell the ERC that if they want to be really gender 
neutral uh, and if they want to encourage female researchers, this is the least they could do. So could, could I see a show of hands about that? And Ines is making... That's true, the whole program, you're right, thank you very much. Let's, let's be bold here and strapping. The whole program. So all, all the research funds, let's make sure that the panels, the decision makers are actually aware. Great. I think there's a huge, huge score of hands here. And then um, the last thing, the gender angle in science. I think like the Norwegian Research Council, um, the Horizon 2020 and all the programs also could add that requirement that if applicable, and in many cases it is, the gendered angle in science needs to be one of the measures. If applicable, if applicable but I think it's very often applicable. Why didn't you add something, Ines? I think I, I'm missing a point here. No, I, I would suggest that this is made a bit more specific because these articles have been already written in forms of amendments, yeah. and they have been discussed here in the parliament, they have been discussed by governments, they have been discussed in the environment of the commission. So the articles... So are we too late? The articles, I don't think we are oh. late, and so I think that we need to be specific about what articles should be included in the final regulations. Okay, the so we're going to study which articles we, yeah. we can include. Yeah, it's articles 12 and 13. Okay. Uh, but the general principle of trying to include as, as much as possible the gendered angle yeah, in that's science? That's what these two articles exactly um, cover. Okay, they they are the specific implementation of this general recommendation at the beginning. Okay. But this is the very wide uh, 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 sentence which doesn't have applicability. Exactly, so we need to move towards applicability. Articles 12 and 13 are the ones that are really important for effective implementation. Okay, so who is in favor of, of supporting that recommendation? Hands, please. Great. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm missing points, if you think it should be more pinpointed, go to Elizabeth in the break, speak to Inez, and I think we can work this out. Um, so I think instead of, of taking many more questions, because we're already at, at the, the time, uh, maybe we should just wrap the whole symposium up. I, I think it's been absolutely wonderful. I want to thank you all. I want to thank the, the colleagues from the National Science Foundation for bringing in their perspectives. I think it's going to be wonderful to upgrade this wonderful summit even more next year. So I urge you all to come to the U.S. I'm sure you'll be invited by Elizabeth and her group once it's, it's coming. I thank you for being here and sharing with us all your knowledge and experience. And um, let's keep this movement going and let's stick together. Thank you very much.